There's a quote from Ken Noonan, the superintendent we were talking about from Oceanside Unified School District. I thought bilingual education would be harmful, but I was wrong. The kids have taken to English and are absorbing it like sponges. And this is a guy who, as Ron Ons told you, 30 years ago was on the ground floor of promoting and advocating and being really um, very strongly and passionately in favor of bilingual education. He didn't like 227, and he didn't like the changes that it was going to bring. So let's find out what you think. Bob from Santa Clara, let's bring you in the discussion. Hi. Bob, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, welcome. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm thinking that they, they should put more money into schools, you know, break down and have the bilingual kids learn on computers where they can uh, learn the, the subject that they're working on, and then they can learn English after discuss the, the problems. You mean you'd like to see the new technology foster bilingual understanding or sure, more right. bicultural stuff, yeah? Right. And well, also, whatever class, if you have mathematics, it could be taught in, in every language. Whatever kid that speaks, that's what they should learn it. Well, let me ask uh, Ruben Rosales, is that one way to restore perhaps uh, a movement? Because the movement is definitely away from bilingual education. Is this a, a movement back toward, perhaps? Well, I mean, in terms of uh, his comment of whether doing high-tech teaching would, would be the key, uh, I, again, I'm going back to the basics of just the pure what's happening in the classroom right now in a lot of communities here in California. And because they're trying to interpret this, these kids are not getting services. So if we can just go back to having them taught by teachers that are qualified, taught by teachers with the skills to teach them and not have kids teaching them, uh, then I think that's a key thing. And it's, I don't blame the teachers, believe me. It's administrators that are trying to interpret this whole 227 thing. And Paul Samuelson says students do more when they're asked to do more. Students will perform more when they're asked to perform more. So if you make students learn English the way, say, it used to be done generations ago when people came here from Eastern Europe or from Asia, aren't you saying... You know, you have to come up to the standard, and that's all there is to it, and they'll do more? Well, I wouldn't interpret bilingual education as an effort for them to do less. I think that, uh, with, again, a bilingual program that is fully funded and that is supported by the administration will be asking kids to do more because they're asked to do things in two languages, and they're asking them to bring, bring them up to grade level. But at the same time, you're saying to them, we're going to give you this help until you really feel comfortable with the English language. I mean, that's really what it was designed to Well, I think by law, they're guaranteed equal access to education, and that's all part of our case is that their civil rights have been violated, they're not getting equal access to education. So is it a civil rights violation, or, is it, or does it become sort of an entitlement? Ron Unz, what do you think? Well, I, I think it became what might be called an entitlement. I mean, the truth is the people who set up bilingual education 30 years ago, including Ken Noonan, for example, had the best of intentions. They believed sincerely that it would improve the education of immigrant children, it would help them, and it just didn't work. I mean, there are many times theories that sound good, but they don't work in practice. The problem is, by the time the evidence started building up that it didn't work, there was a huge entrenched bilingual education industry. There were all the bilingual teachers and bilingual administrators. Well, let me get you back to What was the real demonstrative or, in your mind, uh, particularly dramatic evidence? Because certainly there's anecdotal evidence to the contrary. When you talk to young people who say, because of bilingual education, I, I got the education that I really well, merited. Well, here's one piece of evidence. There are 140 different immigrant language groups in California. In other words, children speak 140 different languages when they start school. The only group of immigrant children that received large quantities of this allegedly beneficial bilingual education system were Spanish-speaking immigrant children. All the others were tended to be immersed in English. And of all the immigrant groups in California, Spanish-speaking children did the worst in school. They had the highest dropout rates and the lowest test scores and the lowest rate of admissions to college. So in other words, that seems to be an indication that bilingual certainly wasn't helping. And the fact that their test scores now have risen so much once we got rid of bilingual education I think is a sign it was dragging down Hispanic students for all those years. You uh, agree with that, Ruben Rosales? No? Uh, well, I'm a product of bilingual ed. I'm a <laughs> yeah. product of bilingual ed in Pittsburgh, where it was effective at one time. It was fully supported by its administration. You know, I have my college degree. I'm an, I'm an administrator with the Federal Department of Labor. Um, I could, I'm a clear living example that it can work, and it has worked for many people. Of course, one of the arguments you hear about the, the uh, appallingly low statistic of uh, Hispanic uh, graduates from high school is sometimes culture, sometimes you well, know, the fact that they need variables. to work you know, and go to labor. And, exactly. Uh, there's several variables. Bilingual ed is, would be not the one variable I would hang my hat on if I'm going to make that argument. There are several variables, and if you know the community, you know that there's several issues that they have to deal with and why th that happens. And so you, know, you have to keep in mind that, you know, the, again, this law implemented statewide. There's all kinds of things happening statewide. But what about what Ron Hans was saying, that you created a whole industry? I mean, that was why the people of California probably went the way they did on 227. They saw this whole bureaucracy and industry of bio... And as you, as you conceded yourself, you didn't really have that many well-trained teachers as you needed to boot. 
So you had, in other words, something that was failing, at least from all appearances. Well, when I say not enough teachers, isn't that what happened in our case? Is not enough properly trained teachers. Yeah. Right. When I say that, I'm saying that what happened in the school is they farmed the kids out to all classrooms. So you're not going to have the CLAD or B-CLAD certified teachers as required by law in every single classroom in the district. And that's what happened in Pittsburgh. They farmed them out to all classrooms, whereas in a bilingual program, they were put into classrooms where they had enough staff, and the staff was there to support it. So there, there, were, there were enough under the bilingual program. Under this current program, they've just farmed out everywhere, and there's not enough to cover it. And Ron Unz, uh, are you so convinced that you wouldn't have better results if you did have the kind of tra teacher training and uh, I, quality I think, instruction that perhaps Mr. Rosales is talking about here? Well, I think there's a lot of evidence because, remember, even though 227 passed as the law in California, a lot of school districts have resisted the law, have dragged their heels in implementing it. In fact, one comparison case which the supporters of bilingual always used to bring up there was Oceanside down near San Diego, which most strictly followed 227 and completely eliminated bilingual education once the initiative passed. Right next to Oceanside, there's a neighboring district called Vista, which supporters of bilingual said had a very strong bilingual program. They kept half their students in bilingual education using waivers. They did everything to strengthen their bilingual program in the last two years. It's a district of the same size of Oceanside, the same demography, same type of students. Oceanside's test scores doubled. Last year, VISTA's test scores went down for immigrant students. So if two districts which are very similar, one of them goes English-oriented, English immersion, and has huge increases in test scores, the other school district stays with bilingual as much as possible and shows a decline in test scores. I think the evidence is there. But the evidence from your perspective, Ruben Rosales, is in Pittsburgh you're hurting. We're hurting. We're having, we're having a crisis mode. We've had kids retained. And I'm not just saying this because it's my opinion. We've had the state and federal agency come in and prove this. And the kids have been retained. They've been hurt. They've been held back. They've dropped out. Uh, so it's a crisis mode. And, that, and this is an indication of what's happening statewide. And you've got to keep in mind that if you have a school following it to the letter of the law, I bet you that there are some services for there that it's not happening throughout the, the, the state of California. What about that argument, though, that you had this whole wave of immigrants who came here, they didn't have bilingual education, they had to learn the, they had to learn the English language. Um, or if they didn't, then they were lost. And a lot of them did well, and, you know, it was kind of a Darwinian thing, you know, but... but in other words, that argument has been used and often is Oh, used. yeah, and, I've, and believe me, I've heard it. I, I think that you got to, first of all, think of the timing and, and where we are in society. At those times, education, you can probably get by with a high school education and go on and work in some trade and become successful. In today's world, you need beyond high school to be successful. So we have a choice. Either we educate these kids now and deal with them, or we're going to deal with them later when they become adults. So to succeed in today without some support, it's going to be difficult for them to get through high school and to go on to college. They need some support. They need some basic services. They need equal access to education. And you have access to join us here. You have uh, equal opportunity. In fact, we invite you to do so. If it's between 6 and 7, it means we're live and we welcome your calls. If you want to weigh in here on bilingual education or if you have a question you'd like to ask either of the guests, please do so. We're at 1-800-94-BAY-TV. We ought to do a much better job ensuring that every child speak English. Having said that, though, I would also say that English only is a formula for no sales in a global economy. That's Delaine Easton, who, of course, is superintendent of public instruction, talking about this. And since she brings up the global economy, English only, uh, she's got a point there, Ron Unz. We're moving into a global, I mean, you made your fortune in this global economy, and, and indeed, <laughs> we're... Uh, very mindful of multiculturalism now as never before, particularly in some ways because of globalization. Doesn't this have to be factored into instruction and language learning? Oh, certainly. In other words, I, I work in Silicon Valley, and obviously there's so much international trade concerned with technology and issues like that. The world is a much smaller place than it used to be. And in fact, I think it's a very good thing if children in our schools learn additional important world languages at a young age, languages like Chinese, like German, like Spanish. But the truth is, English is far and away the most important of these languages. English is not now and never has been America's official national language. But over the last 10 or 20 years, it's become the entire world's unofficial international language. It's the language of science, it's the language of technology, it's the language of business. And I think the most important things for our schools to do is ensure that young children are taught English as quickly as possible once they start school. And under 227, that really is the law in California. On the other hand, Ruben Rosales, I suppose you can make the case, here we are now, 
living in a world in California where whites are the demographic minority, where there are more and more Hispanics, where Spanish is, uh, se habla espanol all over the state of California. Um, I mean, it's become a very important language. So what does that mean in terms of bilingual education? Maybe you could argue that Caucasian kids and Asian kids and Native Americans and African Americans and so forth, they should also be learning Spanish. I mean, maybe they should be learning Asian languages as well since we're on the Pacific Coast, right?